theme of this presentation is the Industrial Revolution and what happens after. As an engineer, because I'm an engineer, the, I trace the source of the Industrial Revolution back to this time and efficiency movement that was founded by Frederick Winslow Taylor and by Frank Gilbert. They didn't invent the assembly line, but they, they give us a symbolic look at what made us rich. It was two things, specialization of labor, which the assembly line facilitates, and economies of scale. Once we give people one job to do, you are no longer a furniture maker, you are a knob turner, you're no longer a bicycle mechanic, you are a spoke installer, then people become more efficient. This is how the Industrial Revolution made us rich. The, the premise for this is to measure everything. And we're still caught up in this culture of measurement. Everything must be measurable to be managed, goes the same. The problem with this is that the harder you work the Industrial Revolution, the more stuck you get. We are no longer in a system in which economies of scale and specialization of labor are going to solve our problems. As we measure more, and as we specialize more, and as we incentivize more, we're just making the problems that the Industrial Revolution has given us worse. And the Industrial Revolution in many ways was great. We used to have starvation. We solved that by mechanizing agriculture. Now we have obesity. We used to have infectious disease. And we solved that by producing antibiotics. Now we have super antibiotic, or we have super bacteria, and we have um, emergent disease. You can see how this goes. Every single issue that the Industrial Revolution solved left us with a new problem. We used to have material scarcity. And in some places, we still have material scarcity. But in the industrialized countries, in the highly developed countries, we no longer have material scarcity. Fossil fuels and mechanization solve that. Instead, we have plastic in the oceans. We have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We have the residue of the Industrial Revolution. And we, gotta, we can't deal with it by pulling on the Chinese finger trap hard. So what are we going to do, and why isn't it working? Remember, Taylor's innovation was piecework. It was this gamification. Daniel Pink wrote a, a book called Drive about what motivates people. And he's done this beautiful RSA anime uh, video on YouTube. And he points out in this slide the usual economic thinking. If you reward something, you'll get more of that something. If you reward something, you get more of it, is the premise. If you want someone to shovel harder, if you want your kid to take out the trash, you can incentivize your kid in this way for the mechanical, for the physical things that don't require a lot of creativity or cognitive labor, yes, this kind of incentive system works. And that was the incentive system that Charlie Chaplin was satirizing in his movie. You're on the assembly line, you have to twist harder and push further. Those incentives work for Taylor, but we're no longer in that kind of economy. Now we need creativity. This is the way that work looked in Winslow Taylor and Gilbert's time. But this is the way that work looks now. Work then, people collaborated in isolation. I turn my knobs and I pass it to you. And you install the slider and I pass it to the next person and the next person. But now, they're interdependent. Here, they're isolated from one another. And as long as each gear does its job, the entire machine works well. But here, they're created and collaborative. They work instead of individually and in sequence, they look work in parallel and in collaboration. We need a new understanding of this post-industrial economy that is going to work for the digital age rather than the industrial age. So this is Drucker. Drucker says our new <coughs> age, we're no longer constrained by the kinds of things that the industrial age was constrained by. The productivity of the industrial worker is still a concern, but it's not our primary concern. Our future will be dictated by the productivity of the knowledge worker. Drucker is seeing this transition from a factory-based economy to a knowledge-based economy. There is now an understanding that all companies are knowledge-based companies. There is no source of value that comes from monopoly because the barriers to entry are so low. There is no source of value that comes exclusively from economies of scale because, again, competition, the economies of scale have been wrung out and competition is so tight on a global scale. It is innovation, it is knowledge that is the source of all business value. So what's our model now? The old model used to be Rockefeller's model. Create a monopoly, establish economies of scale, specialize
specialized labor, become the richest man in the world. That's not the model that works now. We know that Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world. And I've never checked in with Jeff about whether he's driven by shareholders, certainly driven by customers, because that's right at the core of their mission statement. But Jobs built the most valuable company in the world, never held a focus group in his life. These companies are leading consumers and shareholders rather than being pushed by them. And how do they do it? They start with the idea. This is the creativity that Katnam has written his book about. They must produce the idea to practice, and they must bring that idea out to scale. Once you've reduced the good ideas to practice, you've found the ideas that count, the ideas that are valuable to your customers, that's when you go to scale. That's when you exploit the idea by replicating it. Not duplicating it, but finding out the error, finding out the essential features of the, of the idea. You've got a tacit idea that exists only in your imagination. Knowledge. We've said that the 21st century is going to depend upon the productivity of the knowledge worker. Knowledge doesn't come in one flavor. It begins here, highly tacit. This is the knowledge of the experience, the knowledge you can't touch or feel. And it moves over to highly explicit. This is the knowledge embodied in blueprints and software code and materials. Along the way, it goes through lots of transformations. So we're going to start with experiences and ideas. We reduce them to language, more symbolic language, mathematics, formulas, software code, drawings, specifications, prototypes, and then finally, products. It's these knowledge transformations that every organization has to get really good at it to, to provide value. It's moving from the tacit to the explicit that creates value. How do we do that? Well, Nonaka in the 90s wrote a great book on the knowledge creating company, and he created these four knowledge conversion processes. It's a little bit of an oversimplification, but thank goodness. This is not Nonaka's knowledge spiral. What Camilla and I have done is peel the knowledge spiral apart because Nonaka didn't care about exploitation and entrepreneurship. For him, the endpoint was a better idea, but for us, the endpoint is a new customer or a sale. So we peel apart the knowledge spiral, we turn it into the wheel of knowledge. We start by sharing the ideas, which is what this group is doing now. We make the ideas explicit in the form of drawing specifications, prototypes. Other people have to interact with those to have the experience of them. They're taking the explicit prototype and they're making it tacit again and experiential. And we run this back and forth like they did on the tennis court in the McDonald's movie until we get it right. And then we crank up the assembly line. We do it over and over and over again. So how does this fit with Daniel Pink? Well, when a task is complex, complicated, creative. We're over here in the tacit area where people's feel for it counts. The heuristics that they apply, sort of this unstated expertise is what's going on. But when we get over on the right, when we turn it into an algorithm, go with the carrots and the sticks. There is no one best way to manage the knowledge worker. There are different ways to manage different types of knowledge. Here's our spider web full of chaos. When we're thinking about knowledge, and this relates to universities and it relates to companies too, the metaphor that we used to use is the tree of knowledge. We had one branch, and that was for marketing. And we had another branch, and that was for research. And we had another branch, and that was for operations. And all of these different specialties, it looks, you turn the tree upside down, you get the typical corporate org chart. It is branched out and specialized. And people have difficulty communicating from branch to branch. They typically have to go back to a common trunk and then back out again, and it's slow. But it's efficient. It takes the transaction costs out of the organization. It makes everything cheaper. A PhD student is now like a leaf extended out on the end of a little twig, a specialist in something almost so inconsequential that you can barely see the rest of the tree. This is no longer the way the knowledge is organized. Because of the World Wide Web, because of the internet, because the marginal cost of data is uh, approaching zero, knowledge is now organized in a web. The, the spider web of chaos, as you put it, is the new way to organize knowledge. We no longer have a law library, and an engineering library, and an English library. And we just all go to scholar.google.com and we look for the journal articles. I mean, these are the faculty experience. It's the same thing for people who want to learn something. They use the web to learn. The future will have more spiders, fewer leaves. So how are we going to handle this spider web of chaos? What are the processes that we're going to use? I've alluded to some of them. On the left end, 
When we're doing the creativity, we need activities that will accelerate trust building, will accelerate creativity, idea generation, and idea testing. What are those? The metaphors? Circular economy is a metaphor. We've used in our classes improv theater to try and generate more ideas. I'm not necessarily good ones. They don't have to be good here. They have to get good here. When we turn them into prototypes, models, and a new phrase that we've coined, you might not feel like your product is perfect. But if you're not embarrassed by the first version, you're probably not doing it right. This idea of a proto product says it's for sale, but we are not done. Version 2, version 2.1, version 2.2 is on its way. We're constantly updating and revising in accordance with the feedback that we get from people who are experiencing it. How do they get that experience? Well, one way is to use it. We role play, we simulate, we certainly do focus group. The more realistic that experience is, the better the feedback is going to be. And when we get it right, we replicate, 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 replicate. This is the What's happening after the Industrial Revolution is a knowledge-based economy, and these are the kinds of knowledge processes that we have to get better at. Camilla's thesis is that at each stage, we will find play. I'm Camilla Jensen, also known as Dr. Lego. I did my PhD at Arizona State University, focusing on creative methods for problem solving and knowledge sharing, value creation. One of my favorite methods for that is called Lego Serious Play. And it's a method that's better experienced than explained. So I built a few models to share it with you. The Lego method itself is a step-by-step -step process that helps you gain higher levels of insight about the topic you're exploring, more creativity, new perspectives. It also is helpful for team alignment, more innovation, better collaboration. Play has been stripped out of our corporate cultures in some respect. And then in others, the ping pong tables and the volleyball courts and Silicon Valley, celebrated but only as frivolous. The key to these knowledge operations are serious play. Play on the stage, uh, in role play, for example. Gamification in the incentive structures for peace work. The prototyping and the simulation that goes on with testing the idea of a new product. Ford believed in this separation of work and life. And we still hear it in our language now, work-life balance. I say that with work-life balance. I mean, it's really just all one big life. We should be playing while we're at work, and we should be working while we're at play.